Jeffrey Sachs is a population controlling guru. We need Bernie Sanders as president and we need him urgently. We need to get our country back on track and Bernie is the leader. This is a month after Donald Trump addressed Davos and stuck the MAGA finger in their face. Here's what Francis, the Vatican and Jeffrey Sachs had to say in response. And it is a dangerous country right now. It will be absolutely dangerous if Trump wins re-election. Trump wins re-election. Trump wins re-election. He's a promoter of contraception overtly all around the world. We played this clip many times. We'll do it again because Jeff just got real interesting. So the world is uh, getting very crowded. And the big problem is that in the poorest countries, uh, families are still having six, seven, or eight children. That's what's putting this uh, tremendous growth of population. Well, I think the main thing is that uh, when women in poor countries have better choice, they're better informed, they have education, they choose to have fewer children. Uh, they choose to adopt family planning or contraception. As well as the author of Target Africa. And I'll show you my mother, I'll show you my mother's friends, I'll show you my aunties uh, and, and our family friends who decided that they wanted this large family because to us, a child born, you know, even as the international world is looking at this African baby born as a, an unnecessary increase in population, but for us, every baby born uh, is a new member, a valued member of our community of love. We are particularly committed to this initiative since the forum has been at the origin in its annual meeting in Davos of the Global Fund, Gavi and CEPI, together with the Gates Foundation and other founders of those crucial organizations, particularly today. Jeffrey Sachs is the co-author of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, nations which promote abortion. Don't let anybody tell you they don't, because they do. Now here's a screenshot of the UN.org page on Sustainable Development Goals. Do you see that? Access to legal abortion services needed to prevent 47,000 women dying each year. Okay? That's their website. So your excellencies, your eminences, <laughs> you think that we're being disrespectful to His Holiness for pointing this out? He's the one that is scandalizing the world with what he's doing. He doesn't give a damn about what this means, the scandal that he's causing, promoting population controlling, pro-abort, pro-contraception people like Jeff. He doesn't care, but we're supposed to be dutiful little Catholics and just keep our mouths closed and pray for him? Really? That's it? I'm just a layman, your excellencies and your eminences. It's your job to stand up to this man. Because now it's all out in the open. You saw him with Nancy Pelosi. Archbishop Cordelino's praying for Nancy Pelosi's conversion. And she goes to the Vatican and Francis gives her a beautiful red carpet audience for, 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 for a half a day of photo ops. So she can look at Cordelino and say, go to hell, your excellency. So it's not just traditional Catholics that Francis is coming after. He's coming after anyone who's keeping the faith the Catholic faith in 2021. Because democracy basically means government by the people, of the people, for the people. But the people are retarded. So let us say, Government by the retarded, <laughs> for the retarded, of the retarded. Here is what Freemasonry is. Freemasonry uses two allegories. You can see that here at the bottom. Turning base metals into gold, alchemy. You take lead and somehow through magic or science you turn it into gold. This is an allegory of taking human persons, human society, and creating transhuman, superhuman, uberhuman. In other words, making man into God, which is exactly what the serpent said to Eve in the garden. The second allegory that Freemasonry uses is building a new Solomon's temple. 
It is a new humanity, a new government, a new religion, a new economy, a new bank. And that's what you see up here at the top. What is Freemasonry? Freemasonry is the idea that we are Masons. We are building something. What are we building? We are building, according to the Freemasons, a one world religion, which will be the precursor to the Antichrist. Just FYI, spoiler alert. They are building a one world government. Spoiler alert, also part of the plan of the Antichrist towards the end of time. They're building a one world economy, a one world bank, and a one world currency. Also, if you read the apocalypse, that's what the whole 666 thing is about. You can't buy or sell because the Antichrist will control the economy, the bank, and the currency. Now, if you just believe the book of Revelation, the apocalypse is bogus, the New Testament is bogus, Christianity is bogus, you're not going to be impressed with what I just said. But if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you believe in the New Testament, if you believe the book of the apocalypse, you know that a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world economy currency is coming. Freemasonry wants to take all the diversity in the world, celebrate it into one. It's an anti-Catholicism. See, the Catholic Church is universal, but it respects languages, ethnicities, even nations. I mean, if you look in the Middle Ages, you know, there were there was the King of France, and there was the King of Poland, and there was the King of England. All of these were part of what we call Christendom. The popes never wanted all these nations to become a one world government. There was a Holy Roman Empire, but it never was to absorb all the others. Different kingdoms were recognized and honored as kingdoms. Why? Because Catholics believe in subsidiarity. We believe in government by uh, locality. In other words, it's better for a local town to choose the speed limits or the curriculum than it is for a faraway capital like Washington, D.C. to choose those things. That's subsidiarity. That's a Catholic principle. In the New World Order, in Freemasonry, that's not the case. Everything is united for a new humanity. Now, you might be saying, Marshall, you are so crazy. You you're a conspiracy theory. I can see you got tinfoil right behind you here. This is happening really, really fast. I'm going to make this a little smaller because I want you to memorize those things. Tattoo those into your brain. I was sent this this morning by one of my Patreons. Rex. Oops, that's really big, isn't it? Can I make it smaller? I can't make it smaller. Drats. Wait, I, I have an idea. Let me take this version and see if that... Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I was sent this this morning by one of my Patreons. Thanks to all the Patreons, by the way. If you want to support this channel and get free books, patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Look at this flyer. I got to make it big so you can read it. Okay. Elite Global Leaders Conference, Saturday, October 23rd, 2021. Where? At the Vatican. By invitation only, technology that empowers humanity. Keynote presentation, the code. Programming our future for good. Welcome comments by Father Philip Lari, Chair and Dean of Pontifical Lateran University in the Vatican, Humanity 2.0, Author Artificial Humanity. of sweet-smelling incense upon burning charcoal is a sign that solemnly expresses deep sentiments of sacrifice and prayer in the hearts of men. The destruction of the incense by fire is a symbol of sacrifice. 
The smoke ascending heavenward is the symbol of prayer. By God's own command, the use of incense was prescribed in the sacrifices of the Jewish religion. In imitation, the pagans appropriated the incensing ceremony to honor their idols. The Christian religion, very early in its history, restored the use of incense to its proper place, the public worship of the one true God. Now, I don't know about you guys, but nothing makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside and, and truly unified with my fellow co-religionists. Nothing makes me feel more that way than feathers and rattlesnake rattles at mass. That, that's unity. When I go there and they're walking around with those feathers and, and doing all that stuff, man, that feels good to me. Don't you think? That's Kaplan. Every single liberal, democrat, globalist, evil policy out there, Francis is supporting it all. I don't expect you to believe me. So we're going to spend the next, the rest of this program just giving you the proof that you need. I'm going to put the link at the bottom. I want you to watch the entire video if you have any question what Francis is all about. It's a video I don't think he expected very many people to see. It's Francis addressing the World Meeting of Popular Movements, which is a semi-communist organization that promotes social justice, so they say. It's Francis addressing the World Meeting of Popular Movements, which is a semi-communist organization that promotes social justice, so they say. Let's just take a little listen of Francis now, just a couple of days ago. In the name of an excluded worker, migrant, person of, pa person of the world, we welcome Francis to our gathering and we will listen carefully to his message. We hope the rest of the world listen to him and inspire others to hear his message in, the, in our struggle, in our struggle and hopes as we continue to fight for dignity and social justice during this crisis in the world of COVID-19. Hermanas, hermanos, queridos, poetas sociales, así me gusta llamarlos, poetas sociales, porque ustedes son poetas sociales porque tienen la capacidad y el coraje de crear esperanza allí donde solo aparece descarte y exclusión. Poesía quiere decir creatividad. Ok, stop, stop, crean, stop, stop it right there. Social poets... This is what I mean, not the slickest guy. What's he talking about? Social poets? Really? Oh, holiness, I'm a social poet? Who does this work with? You know, this is, what is he, what is this Francis now, 84 years old, this old guy, thinking he's so woke, he's trying to, you know, <laughs> empower the social poets of the world. And here comes the papal pandering from beginning to end, papal pandering. You know what I think? I know a lot of you, some of you anyway, are not going to like this. Francis is a racist. He really is. He really is. And we saw him when we were in Rome. He was exploiting the indigenous peoples of the Amazon at the Synod back in Rome 2019. The big, smart, white chief was telling all the little black and brown people to wear their feathers and let him appropriate their cultural identity to push the political agenda of a bunch of white guys from Davos. There's no other way of explaining this. They actually lined up People from the Amazon in feathers. I don't know much about the Amazon. I was one of those who kind of fell for it at first. Well, really? They still dress like this? No. Of course they don't. Of course they don't. But Francis was to make sure you wear your old stuff. You know, those cool feathers. and Do all that because it sells well. You know, the cameras will pick up on that. Why is that not racist? Why is it not racist? Of course it is. 
And have you heard of Francis listening to the people of the Amazon ever since? Have you heard anything about the Amazon since the Amazon Synod? I haven't, and I pay attention to this stuff. Because it was a game. It was a thing he was doing at the time, along with Pachamama, to push the Great Reset, to push the New World Order. And he was exploiting indigenous peoples to get there. I watched him do it with my own eyes. And now he's doing it again, in the case of this talk that we're playing right now. Durante este tiempo pasaron muchas cosas. Muchas cosas han cambiado. Son cambios que marcan puntos de no retorno. Porque retornar a los esquemas anteriores sería verdaderamente suicida. Y si me permite enfocar un poco las palabras, ecocida y genocida. This is the moral imperative of the Great Reset. We can never go back like robots. We can never go back to the old normal. We can never go back to the old normal. Now is a historical moment, a time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system. We have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. What is it that would make it so that history would look at this crisis as the great opportunity for reset? The Great Reset is a welcome recognition that this human tragedy must be a wake-up call. The world's problems fit on three sides of a triangle. It's one versus many, man versus nature, and the unfortunate foundation is long-term versus short-term. Any recovery stimulus should have green conditions attached to it. We have to change our economy dramatically in the next 20 or 30 years, and the next 10 years is absolutely decisive. The recovery has to be greener, than any of the previous recoveries. And then we need to couple that with new initiatives to equip more people with the digital skills they'll need. We have to live up to the expectations which we have created, and we will do so. What if the pandemic disappears? How do they know we can never go back? This makes no sense. Pandemics have come in the past, and then they go away. But this one's different. Now, one thing's for sure, according to Francis now, in the same speech, the marginalized, the migrants, they suffered the most under COVID-19. Here's Francis. Todos hemos sufrido el dolor del encierro, pero a ustedes, como siempre, les tocó la peor parte. Los migrantes, los indocumentados, los trabajadores informales sin ingresos fijos se vieron privados, en muchos casos, de cualquier ayuda estatal e impedidos de realizar sus tareas habituales, agravando su ya lacerante pobreza. We lost jobs, we lost careers, we lost mental health, we lost children to suicide and drugs. Massive suffering, Francis. How do you know who suffered the most during COVID? And yet there you are, just exploiting the heck out of people, exploiting the suffering of others once again to score political points with your friends, the globalists. Standards, we can confidently announce tonight that we have just read the single most deranged news story ever printed in this country. So no matter what happens going forward, and God knows what that'll be, this story will live forever as the high watermark of political lunacy. Mark your calendars. It's October 28th, 2021. This is the day that things couldn't possibly get nuttier. And here it is. According to a piece in this afternoon's Wall Street Journal, the Biden administration has decided to pay reparations to illegal aliens. In other words, foreigners who came here without invitation, who came in willful violation of legal statutes passed by our Congress per our Constitution, those people are about to get a groveling apology and huge amounts of cash. Why? Because our government dared to enforce its own laws, which now apparently is immoral. So the Biden White House is going to pay criminals for committing crimes. It's almost impossible to believe that's real, but it is real. According to the journal, the administration plans to, quote, offer immigrant families that were separated during the Trump administration around $450,000 a person in compensation. The U.S. Departments of Justice, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services are considering payments that could amount to close to $1 million per family. A million dollars per family for illegal aliens, 
at exactly the moment that American families are becoming noticeably poorer by the day. You won't be surprised to learn, according to the paper, that nearly a thousand reparations claims have already been filed. Why not? The total payout from all this? More than a billion dollars. So how much is that exactly? Well, let's see. If you're an American citizen who is killed in a war defending your country, our government promises to send your family $100,000. That is less than a quarter of what Joe Biden intends to give illegal aliens for the inconvenience of being deported. They are once again getting $450,000 a piece from your tax receipts. That's more than some of the 9-11 victims got. It's more than any ordinary American ever gets for anything from the U.S. government. Most people in this country just give. Foreigners with no respect for our laws or systems, meanwhile, are hitting the jackpot. So take three steps back. You've got to wonder how long this sort of thing can continue. How long before the people who make this country run, who, by the way, are not the same people who run this country, those are two very different groups, but before the people who make this country run decide they have had enough and they're not going to take it anymore. Why pay your taxes at this point? Seriously. It's too insulting. It's too destructive. It is evil. Now, who knows how long it's going to take to get there, but at this rate, it's coming quick. In the meantime, what can we know? Well, we can be certain how the rest of the world is going to see this announcement. Why wouldn't you cross our border illegally at this point? You'd have to be insane not to. Joe Biden is literally paying people who do it. So not surprisingly, as Fox's Griff Jenkins just reported, new waves of illegal migrants are coming here as fast as they can. Here's one caravan. Chanting liberty, the caravan charges through a checkpoint as the Mexican National Guard stands by watching. The migrants, undeterred by Mexico's foreign minister, Marcelo Ebrard, who says they are being deceived by the organizers. They tell them, let's go in the caravan. We get to the U.S. and they will let us pass. It's not true. You saw what happened with the Haitians. It's the same thing. But the warning isn't breaking the will of the migrants. That's not stopping us because we got, we got the power of God right next to us and he's going to open. That is not going to stop us. We're still proceeding. We're still moving. It's not going to stop us. We act like this is an act of God. We just can't stop it. But that's not what's happening. The Biden administration is actively encouraging this. And more so even today. The legislative framework that Democrats released today would give amnesty to millions and millions of illegal aliens. It's the largest amnesty proposed in the history of this country. The Center for American Progress, which is, of course, closely aligned with the Biden White House, released an analysis of this, and it concluded that nearly 7 million illegal aliens living here would get green cards under this proposal. Specifically, it would legalize anyone here illegally as long as that person could show he or she arrived in this country, follow this, between January 1st, 1972, during the first Nixon administration, and December 31st, 2009. That's a span of 47 years. Quite a strike zone. But what do you ask about the millions of illegals who've come here since 2009? Well, they're fine too, actually. The Biden administration has just put out a list of no-go zones, not places that foreigners who break our laws can't go. They can go anywhere, especially where you live. But a no-go zone for federal officers who are trying to enforce those laws. So ICE agents, according to the Biden White House, are no longer allowed to enter schools, hospitals, healthcare facilities, places of worship, playgrounds, child care centers, crisis centers, homeless centers, Rehab facilities, food banks, disaster relief centers, funerals, parades, and many other places. Basically, they're not allowed anywhere. So that's it for immigration laws. They're done. They're totally ignored. They're totally unenforced. The question is, the one that's never asked by anybody, is how exactly do American citizens benefit from these changes? Well, let's see. Here's a recent report from the state of Florida. When Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd discusses this horrific car crash that killed a five-year-old girl, the anger in his voice is hard to miss. Had he been in his home country last Saturday night, like he should have been, our five-year-old beautiful little girl would have been alive. But instead, Ernesto Lopez Morales was driving down State Road 60 in Mulberry. He has already drinking six 32-ounce beers by his own admission. And the sheriff says Lopez Morales was out buying more beer. We're told his headlights were off, he was speeding, and he slammed into the back of a Hyundai Elantra driven by a Plant City mother. 
The impact crushed the back half of the Elantra, including the back seat, where the five-year-old was in her car seat. So here's the point of that awful story. That man, Ernesto Lopez Morales, should never have been here in the first place. He was here illegally like millions of others. He didn't even have a driver's license. So after downing the equivalent of 16 regular-sized beers, 16, he killed a five-year-old girl in a car crash. So the question is, what will Joe Biden do about things like this? Well, nothing. We know that for certain because Biden has already announced that drunk driving is no longer grounds for deportation. You only arrest for the purpose of dealing with a felony that's committed, and I don't count drunk driving as a felony. I don't count drunk driving as a felony. Well, that's a big change. Oh, that only applies to people here illegally, not to you. The Biden administration, once again, is making this country poorer, more chaotic, and in many places, much more dangerous. It's not an accident. Of course, it's being done on purpose. People who are close to it see it every day. James Chilton is close to it. Chilton's a fifth-generation rancher from the state of Arizona. His property abuts a five-mile stretch of the Mexican border. Ooh, woe to him. Because over the last few months, his ranch has been transformed into something unrecognizable. His ranch is now covered with garbage dropped by people coming into this country. Illegal aliens fire weapons at Border Patrol officers as they head back and forth into Mexico. So watching all this happen, watching his land be destroyed by foreigners, Chilton had an idea. So the Biden administration, as you may have noticed, claims it cares deeply about the environment, about something called ecological justice, and this seemed unjust. So Chilton called the Forest Service for help. Maybe they would save his patch of the environment from being poisoned and destroyed. But no, they didn't. The Forest Service said they couldn't come to Chilton's ranch because the property was too dangerous to patrol. Federal agents can't even go there. This is America. To push an agenda of dreaming of a new world order. If you do watch this entire talk, I want you to count the number of times this guy says dreaming. Si todos los que por amor lucharon juntos contra la pandemia pudieran también soñar juntos un mundo nuevo, qué distinto sería todo. Soñar juntos. But then, as if that's not bad enough, he makes it plain as day that what he wants is what <laughs> Bill Gates wants. Francis, like Bill Gates, wants to vaccinate the entire world. Here he is. And while we're at it, Francis is going to stop the arms race again. Quiero pedirles en nombre de Dios a los fabricantes y traficantes de armas que cesen totalmente su actividad. Oh, that's brilliant, Francis. I'm sure that China is going to be all down with that as you and your globalist buddies ride your unicorns over to Davos and draw rainbows into snowbanks. All of this is possible, so says the leader of two billion Catholics. If only big tech would crack down harder on your freedom of speech. Quiero pedirles en nombre de Dios a los gigantes de la tecnología que dejen de explotar la fragilidad humana, las vulnerabilidades de las personas para obtener ganancias sin considerar cómo aumentan los discursos de odio. El grooming, las fake news, las teorías conspirativas, la manipulación política. And for him, all of the world's problems can be solved, not by turning to Jesus Christ or the social teaching of the church, but by turning to the pro-abortion, pro-gay marriage, pro-contraception, population controlling United Nations. Go, Francis. Los conflictos deben resolverse en instancias multilaterales como las Naciones Unidas. Because we need to turn to the United Nations, so says Francis, because evil things like meritocracy nullify our poetic capacity. Como todos aquellos que nos lleve a la indiferencia, la meritocracia y el individualismo. Estas narrativas solo sirvieron para dividir nuestros pueblos y minar y neutralizar nuestra capacidad poética. What is this man smoking? Our poetic capacity, he says, and the capacity to dream together. Nuestra capacidad poética. La capacidad de soñar juntos. Okay, you got that? You see, we need to dream together 
because our hands and brains, says Francis, are not enough. I kid you not. Here it is. Dije reflexiones, pero tal vez cabría decir sueños, porque en este momento no alcanza el cerebro y las manos. Necesitamos también el corazón y la imaginación. Necesitamos soñar para no volver atrás. Dream, so that we do not go backwards. Present on the altar, under the appearance of bread and wine, but as sacrificed with thee, I say, this is my blood. Take it as thine own. I care not if the species or appearances of my life remain. My duties or my health or my wealth, these are but the accidents. But my substance, my body, my soul, my intellect, my will, all that makes me thine. Take, consecrate, transubstantiate, so that the Heavenly Father looking down upon thee may say to me as to thee, Thou art my beloved son. In thee am I well. Hmm. When you can snatch the pebble from my hand, you will have learned. And you know what else? This is something else I learned from this, from this incredibly beautiful speech from His Holiness. Dreams of fraternity will save the world. Soñemos juntos porque fueron precisamente los sueños de libertad e igualdad, de justicia y dignidad, los sueños de fraternidad los que mejoraron el mundo. And this part is fun. The reason all this talk about dreams, do you know why? I didn't know at first. Did you know this? I didn't know this. Turns out, the reason we have to dream about a new world order is because, Francis says, the God of surprises is a dreamer. Y estoy convencido de que en esos sueños se va colando el sueño de Dios para todos nosotros que somos sus hijos. Dream a little dream for me. Ah, da, 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 da. It's all about dreaming. It's all about dreaming. Yes, dream together. That's the ticket. Otherwise... According to Francis, now this gets a little murky for me. He says, otherwise, if we don't dream together, we dream a little dream together, we are like toughs and losers, he says. Don't be like toughs and losers. And by the way, according to Francis, the tango gets it right. Sueñen. Sueñen juntos. No caigan en esa resignación dura, ¿no? Y... Y perdedora, ¿no? Que el tango lo expresa también. Dale que va, que todo es igual. Que allá en el horno se vamos a encontrar. The tango again. I know he's from South America, but what's with this guy in the tango? According to Francis now, <laughs> the good Samaritans of our day are the George Floyd peaceful protesters. ¿Saben lo que me viene a la mente a mí ahora, junto a los movimientos populares, cuando pienso en el buen samaritano? ¿Saben lo que me viene a la mente? Las protestas por la muerte de George Floyd. My city of Minneapolis was burned down, parts of it to the ground. Most of it is still boarded up. They burned down the police station, they burned down, people died in there, right? All that happened, according to Francis, by good Samaritans. Now I ask you, what is this other than a sacrilegious abuse of the Word of God? You got the Pope actually abusing sacred scripture here by a bunch of criminals who torched a city. Well, they're the good Samaritans that Jesus was telling the parables about. <laughs> and it's because they're such great people, what we need to do is follow those who support them on the far left. And all we need to do at the end of the day is turn to the pro-abortion sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Es bueno saber que en esto no estamos solos. 
las Naciones Unidas intentaron establecer algunas metas a través de los llamados Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, pero lamentablemente desconocidas por nuestros pueblos y la periferia. Sexual and reproductive health and rights is nothing more than code for global family planning that includes abortion. This is the very same language that is found in the Vatican-endorsed Sustainable Development Goal number 5.6. Ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. What else would needs, needs to be said? He cares more, obviously about climate change based on junk science than the death of babies, a slaughter of babies, the human sacrifice of babies. You know, because that's why we're suffering. That's why this is happening to the world, because it's coming back. It's coming back. The chickens are coming back to roost. That's why the world is dying, because of abortion, because of apostasy, because we've turned our backs on Almighty God, and Francis doesn't care. So Francis, then, his entire pontificate should be a wake-up call. His pontificate is a chastisement from God. You know why? Because it is calling us back to the faith. Even the Pope has turned his back on God. And that's a scary time. When the shepherd turns his back on God, he's turning his back on the flock. When he turns his back on the flock, the wolves are going to have their way with the sheep. And that's exactly what's happening right now. So we survive what's going on here this night by putting our, our, our heads together, by praying, by gathering together as the sheep who no longer have shepherds and to, to preserve, return to our knees, go back to the old faith of our fathers, go back to the Latin mass. Yes, I'll say it again, to hell with the spirit of Vatican II. Vatican II was the great reset. Vatican II is what enabled them to dismantle the church to bring us to where we are right now. God helps those who help themselves, and it's time for us to help ourselves. It's time for us to resist Francis to his face because it's what God asks of us, fidelity and loyalty to tradition and to the teachings of the, chur of the church that cannot be questioned and that Francis ignores and minimizes on a daily basis. God expects us to stand up for what our church teaches, every single doctrine, every single dogma. And if the Pope or an angel of light is not doing it, let him be anathema, so says scripture. We gotta decide what is it gonna be? Is it gonna be Francis or is it gonna be the faith of our fathers? <laughs> I'm Michael Matt for the TV. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next week. In order to do this, the hierarchy has said to apostatize the doctrine, deny Christ, dishonor his church. The Martullian ecologism, Irenistis ecumenism, that is a prelude to the constitution of the universal religion. The fourth revolution theorized by Klaus Schwab and the family of international finance find in Bergoglio not a neutral spectator, which would itself already be an unheard of thing, but actually a zealous cooperator who abuses his own moral authority in order to support a extra outside the church the project of the dissolution of traditional society. While Adinta within the church, he pursues the project of the demolition of the church in order to replace her with a philanthropic organization of Masonic inspiration. And it is scandalous, as well as a source of great sorrow, to see that in the face of this ruthless and cruel massacre, 
the majority of bishops are silent, or rather, they align themselves obediently out of fear, self-interest, or ideological blindness. On the other hand, today's hierarchy comes from the conciliar school. It has been formed and chosen in view of this evolution. In addition to the Episcopate, all of the religious order, university and Catholic institutions have been occupied since the Council by fifth columns that have formed generation of clergy, politicians, intellectual, entrepreneurs, bankers, professors and journalists indoctrinating them into progressive ideology. And just as the left has done in the political and cultural sphere, so within the church the innovators have ostracized any voice of dissent, driven out those who are not aligned and expel those who resist. The persecution we are witnessing today is no different from that of decades past, but now it has been extended to the masses. While previously it focuses on individuals and the ruling class, this applies to both, to civil and ecclesiastical world confirming the pactum scelere, the criminal conspiracy between the deep state and the deep church. It seems to me that in this conspiracy, the role of the Jesuit has been decisive. It is no coincidence that for the first time in history, a religious of the Society of Jesus is seated on the throne of Peter. In violation of the rule established by St. Ignatius of Loyola. So just the weird thing here is this is where they they switch the hands. I've watched this over and over to analyze it. So here they come in, and then they switch the grip kind of on purpose, and then they hold the grip. I take this just for Francis, with respect and love, please pray for us. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is kind of you. Thank you very much. Pray very for kind. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the del lavoro del uomo diventi per noi cibo di vita eterna. Becomes for us the food of eternal life. Il lavoro sulla terra che ci aiuta. Ah. Display this with great pride in the speaker's office in the capital. Thank you very much. Then there's that. People wonder what that is. Let's look at it one more time on camera. I know some people just arrived late and they haven't seen this video yet. So here it is. He does a little bow. Now, I also got to say this. I meant to say this in the beginning. When a woman meets the Pope, she must wear all black and she must wear a mantilla. This is the custom going back for centuries. In fact, I wrote an article on it a couple years ago. Let's see if I can get it up here. Yeah, here we go. This is from my site. Why did President Trump and Melania wear black in the presence of the Pope? 
You can even see Ivanka, who's left Christianity, sadly, and has become Jewish. But uh, Melania is there wearing the black veil. Uh, you're supposed to wear black. There are some exceptions. If you go to that website, if you read this article uh, that I wrote at taylormarshall.com, you can also get that free book, Thomas Aquinas at 50 Pages, if you go over to the site. Uh, I talk about how and why women wear black and the veil, and there actually are a few exceptions. Certain noble women are allowed to wear white in the presence of Pope, namely the Queen of Belgium, the Queen of Spain, the Grand Duchess of Luxembourg, the Princess of Naples, and the Princess of Monaco. They get to wear white in the presence of a pope with a white mantilla. It's called Le Privilege de Bronc, the privilege of white. You can read all about it, taylormarshall.com. So Nancy Pelosi, though, she's progressive. She, she's not wearing a veil in front of the Eucharist. She's not wearing a veil in front of the pope. She's all about the dismemberment of babies. Here's the best shot of the awkward handshake. We'll analyze that. Actually, I'll analyze it now. Let me put up the uh, the different handshakes here. Okay, so these are the Freemasonic handshakes going on here. And you'll see that the, the first grip of the enter to prem premise is putting the, the thumb on the knuckle, which is what's happening in this photograph. Uh, grip of the... Uh, entered apprentice. It's clearly happening there. Now, whether they're intending this or not, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. It doesn't really matter. They both espouse every single tenet of Freemasonry, and we'll go through what those tenets are. Um, world, one world government, one world currency and economy, one world religion, etc. Transhumanism. But it's right there, and they're posing it. They're posing it. We still... Becomes for us the food of eternal life. Display this with great pride in the speaker's office in the capital. Thank you very much. And embrace it. <laughs> and that's the weird thing. That looks like a, a Egyptian. This right? Can I get it? Place okay. office in the capital. Thank you very much. And embrace this. I'm not sure what that is. Anybody know? Drop me a comment below. Today I will render unconditional obedience to Adolf Hitler. Joe Biden, President of the United States of America, just came from a meeting, a long meeting, with Pope Francis, in which he said, Pope Francis says that he was a good Catholic and that he should continue receiving Holy Communion. I believe that this meeting with Joe Biden and Pope Francis, and then the one we just had a couple weeks ago with Nancy Pelosi and Pope Francis, it's part of a strategy of how the, I want to be careful how I say this, how the human leadership, the corrupt human leadership in the Catholic Church, how they are running cover for the globalist politicians, and in particular politicians who are promoting the termination of innocent human life in the womb. This is part of a plan. And it's an historic day because today Pope Francis has overturned the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas when it comes to giving Holy Communion to public sinners. I'll explain that today. He has overturned St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he's attempted to overturn the canons of the Council of Trent. When has a man claiming to be Pope ever done any of these things? It is truly historic. Now, here's the tweet that uh, Joe Biden 
put out after his meeting. He says, It was an honor to meet with Pope Francis again at the Vatican today. I thanked His Holiness for his advocacy for the world's poor and those suffering from hunger, conflict, persecution, and lauded his leadership in fighting the climate crisis and ending the pandemic. Oh, what about the pandemic? Of babies being killed? About the pandemic of children not growing up in nuclear families because of all the corruption in our society, the tolerance of divorce, contraception, the A word, unnatural relations, etc. What about that? There we go. And run it. Go. Here we go. I'm not sure this is appropriate, but there's a tradition. It has the U.S. seal on the front. But I know my son would want me to give this to you because on the back of it, I have the state of Delaware. The two hundred on the back of it, I have the state of Delaware. The two hundred sixty-first unit my son served with. Now the tradition is, and I'm only kidding about this, if next time I see you, if you don't have it, you have to buy the drinks. I'm, I'm the only Irishman you've ever met who's never had a drink. <laughs> Hanno portato il whisky. I know that. Thank you. 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 Thank